If you got your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. That's where we're going to be, Hebrews chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand high. Somebody will get a Bible to you. Uh, our house crew is walking around with some Bibles. They're going to put some Bibles in your hand. Hebrews chapter 12 is all the way in the back of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Let's pray again. Just thank God for everything that he's doing. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this hour. We thank you for this season. God, you're doing some incredible things. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Babes, can you give me some chapstick? My lips are dry. Dry, dry, dry. Church, I got one more celebration that I got to tell you. One more celebration because this one is personal. This one is very, oh, my son, hey, babe, my son got me. Thank you, Elijah. Excuse me. My, give it up for my son, y'all. <laughs> Taking care of daddy while he's on stage. All right. I got one more celebration to make. This one is big. This one's big for me personally. Um, hey, babe, don't get too excited. But maybe get excited because you're going to get the benefits. Y'all, pastors finally started working out, y'all. Come on, somebody. In 2024, this dad bod is about to go out the door. In 24, it's out the door. I'm working out, y'all, and I'm really excited. I'm really excited. My wife and I are on this health journey. It's not just about looking great. It's about feeling great. It's about creating new rhythms for our life. We started working out. We've been diligent. My wife has been killing it. Rain, sleet, snow, shine. We work out indoors, 45 minutes. Outdoors, 45 minutes. We're doing two-a-days, baby. Y'all remember football, soccer, basketball? Two-a-days. In the morning and in the evening, we're working out. We're trying to get our life right. We're trying to get together. Sometimes my kids come out and exercise with us because they're too on their own little health journey. They're like, man, we want to end too. My son, Isaiah, works out in his room. He's got his weights. We got a little workout room. He goes in there, works out in the workout room. He comes walking with us because you know, I ain't up to running yet. I'm just still walking. We're still walking. We're on a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. I used to run. I don't run no more. I don't run no more. But let me tell you, when we go walking with our kids, our kids are something different. Elijah reaches me like yay high. For every one of my steps, he's got to take two steps. And he still walks faster than I do. This little dude be zooming. And the entire time, Pastor Tanisha, he's talking to me. And I'm like, seriously, how do you have the breath in your lungs? I can barely catch up. He's, Dad, because of this car, and Dad, when I get rich, and I'll buy you this. And I'm like, praise God, prophesy, child. Yes, I receive it all. <laughs> and then sometimes Isaiah, our 18-year-old, he comes with us. Now, Isaiah got a whole different type of energy because he's like a little puppy when we're outside walking. He just take off running, just, just, and he's, and I mean, like, he's doing this for 45 minutes straight, and I'm like, Lord, give me just even a portion of the energy this child has. They got, so how many of y'all wish y'all had that 18-year-old, 13-year-old energy back, that you wish that you could have that same energy? But let me tell y'all, it's not been easy. It's not been easy doing these two days. It's been pretty difficult. I found myself falling off a lot. I found myself restarting this challenge over and over. My wife, what, you 14 days in? Yeah. We ain't going to talk about what day I'm in. But the Bible tells me a righteous man falls seven times but gets right back up again. Hello, somebody. But here, this is what I've discovered. This is what I've discovered is when I'm focused on my goal, when I got my eyes on the prize, when my focus is aligned with the vision of where I want to take my health journey, I am so focused. I stay consistent, and I'm on it and killing it. 
But something happens when I shift my focus to how I feel. When it's 1130 at night and I'm like, man, I don't have, I've only had one workout in. Oh, when I haven't drank all the water that I'm supposed to drink and it's midnight and I'm like, man, I got to take down three-fourths of a gallon over this next hour. When I'm focused on how I feel, that's when I fall off. Listen, and for some of us, that's how we live life. That's how many of us in this room, excuse me, are experiencing life. When we're focused on the goal, when we've got a prize ahead, when we know what we're going after, we are doing really well. We are consistent. doesn't matter whether it's our career, our education, our health journey. We are focused. But as soon as we start thinking about how we feel or how somebody else made us feel, then all of a sudden we start falling off. At the beginning of the year, in the first quarter, we're like, I'm going to read the Bible every single day, and I've got the Bible app, and I'm going to get my streak, and about three weeks in, I was tired. I woke up in a rush. My day got away from me. Once I was focused on the prize, and then when I fo focused on how I feel, I fall off. Well, let me tell you this. Scripture tells us that life is a race. The Bible tells us that life is a race. And kind of the theme text that we're going to cover that is where this series, Run to Win, is coming from is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. It says this, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run? but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. And let me challenge you with this. In the game of life, in the race of life, when you focus on the overall goal, not your temporal goal, not just to lose weight to make more money or get the American dream, when you focus on the overall goal, loving and honoring God, the rest of your goals have meaning. They have purpose, they have clarity, and then you'll just see that they have value. Let me challenge you with this. You know you're running to win if you're running to him. You'll know that you're running to win if you're running to him. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to discover what it means to run to win. Y'all ready for this journey? All right, check out this quick video introducing you to this. somebody who wants to run to win <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 I'm going to begin partly in the verse then I'm going to go back and read the beginning of verse 1 but this is what it says let us run with endurance everybody say endurance the race that is set before us look into Jesus everybody say Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, everybody say the joy, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The first lesson that you can take in this first message is simply this, you have a race that is set before you. You have a race that is set before you. Now, when I begin with the verse, it says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. See why we're trying to drop the weight? 
and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The writer of Hebrews is speaking to a people who contextually are visualizing the Colosseum or a place like that where there's uh, games that are taking place and there's spectators that are watching. So if we are uh, where the, 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 um, the Olympic Games are going to take place, if, if the Olympic Games just took place a, a day or a week ago, and I walk into the room and saying, hey, listen, we are surrounded by a stadium of people watching us. People immediately go back to what just took place. So as he's talking to them, he's jogging their memory, and he's trying to give them this metaphorical picture of people watching these epic games take place. And he says, let us run the race that is set before us because the reality is in this time, the foot race was the longest, most arduous, and most hectic race that one can be involved in in the Greek games. You had to have a level of endurance that was beyond expectation, beyond what you could even believe as human limitations. So when he's talking to them, they immediately get this picture of this great race that people have to run through all types of terrain, all types of, all types of situations that is going to bring an incredible level of difficulty for their life. But also, he's given us a metaphorical picture of the heroes of faith. Because in chapter 11, we're in chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews, uh, they call it the hall of faith. Where it gives this, this, this list of all of these faithful believers who honored God, who believed in God, who had faith in God. And what he's telling them, he's saying, listen, imagine if all of the heroes of the faith, David who conquered giants, uh, Moses who led people through uh, 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 the Red Sea. Uh, imagine all of these people who went before us, Joshua who fought the battle of Jericho. Imagine they're watching you now live out your faith and live out your race. I wonder if we can bring it home a little bit. Imagine your grandfather or your grandmother who you admired, who was such an influential individual in your life. Maybe it was your father. Maybe it was your mother. Maybe it was a brother, a sister, a family member, a mentor, a pastor, a coach, a spiritual father, a spiritual mother who has gone on to glory, but now they're sitting there watching you live out your faith. How would you run if they were watching you? He's saying, listen, they've already ran their race. Now it's your turn. Now you get to run. How are you running? If people are watching your daily life, if, if we open the window into your life, how is your life lived when y'all at school, when you leave home? How is your life lived when you're hanging with your buddies and nobody else is watching? Come on, amen, corner. Y'all can talk back to me. Come on, relevant youth. Y'all know I'm hitting. They're like, damn, why are you calling, our, calling us out like that? Imagine if we were just to take a window into your life. How are you going to run this race? Here's the bottom line. There's a race that is set before all of us. No one has immunity from this race. No one has a pass to get out of the race. Because here's the truth, you didn't pick this race, this race picked you, or better yet, this race was picked for you. This race has a lot to do with your personal destiny. This race has to do with your life's direction. How do we know? This is what it says. The Paul, the writer of Ephesians says this in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to, good, do, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What is he saying? You were created by God intentionally. His handiwork. He crafted you. He crafted your life. You were created by God in Christ Jesus 
for good works. There is a purpose to your life. You're not just arbitrarily living in this world. You're not just existing on this spinning ball. There is a purpose in your life. He has created you for good works that he prepared beforehand that you should walk in. Not only were you created by God, not only do you have a purpose on this earth, but there is a destiny for you to live out that was prepared before you were even born. It was curated, created specifically for you. You can't look at anybody else's race and judge them. You can't look at anybody else's situation and judge them because you got your own situation you got to be worried about. You got a race of your own. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This ain't a sprint. You don't endure a sprint. Sprint happens fast. You get up, you go, you're done. This is a long distance race. This is a marathon. Shout out Nipsey Hussle. The marathon continues as long as you got breath in your lungs. My wife has asthma, pretty heavy. But my wife ran track in high school, and she was pretty darn quick. So <laughs> Y'all online, my wife just says, yeah, I was. <laughs> so humble, Pastor Christine. She was quick. It doesn't matter if she had asthma or not, because she could run the race real quick and be done with it, catch a breath, and she'll be all right. But don't make her run long distance because her lungs will begin to tighten up and she won't be able to breathe. And let me tell you, it's not a sprint. It's a long distance race. We've got to be able to endure. I remember in high school, um, my coach, I was playing football. I wanted to play soccer. They were like, we got to get your lungs up. So you need to join track. And so I was like, cool, I I'll do track. You know, what you want me to do? The 100? The 200? And they were like, no, we want you to run cross country. And I told them the devil is a lie. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 you got to run long distance. I said, listen, I'm Zambian, not Ethiopian. <laughs> I'm not tall and lanky. I'm short and cute. I told him, listen, I can't do that. I have a love-hate relationship with running. I used to run. I finally got to the point where I got my endurance up, and I started jogging. I remember playing college soccer, and then I got married. I don't know about any other men in here, but something happens when you get married and your wife has their first child. They eat. So what do you do, Andrew? You eat. Who am I to leave you on your own on this journey? <laughs> Babe, I am in solidarity with you. How dare me leave you to that fried chicken by yourself? <laughs> How dare I let my wife eat a whole bowl of ice cream, a whole tub of ice cream, mint chocolate chip by yourself? Babe, I'm here suffering with you. I also gained 30 pounds in the process. You say you gained 50? Goodness gracious, Andrew. You need to be on the same situation that I'm on. Two a days, baby, two a days. <laughs> Listen, I started running because in 2008, I went to the doctor and I got on the scale and the doctor loved me enough to tell me, bro, do you wanna die or you wanna live? I said, I choose option A. I mean, B. <laughs> B. I want to live. I want to live. And so I started running. And I loved it because I started getting back to my college bo body, and I started getting back to my college weight. My, my, my body was getting back in shape. Look, my wife getting excited already. Babe. Just wait. I'll be done with the message quick. <laughs> All right. Mm. Keep that picture in your mind, baby girl. <laughs> so, 
as soon as I was running, after a while, I started noticing something was happening in my knee. I would run, and then I would have excruciating pain in my knee. I went to the doctor, and I said, man, what's going on? Why, why every time I run, my knee hurts? He says, well, you've got arthritis in your knee, and your joints are just rubbing against each other. While I loved the benefits of running, I didn't like the effects because it was wearing me out. And some of us are frustrated with life because we've been worn out. We've been worn out by disappointment. We've got things that have taken place in our life, and we're so frustrated with life because we've been walking with a limp. It hurts to run. If we're honest, it just hurts to live. It hurts to get up every single day. It hurts to even think about dreaming or pursuing anything more than what you're doing right then and there. Some of us are frustrated because of abuse that took place in our life. So we feel like we can't run anymore. We're, we're frustrated because of disappointment that happened in our life. So we feel like we, we can't run anymore. Some of us are walking with a limp of mistakes that we made. So we feel like we're not worthy of running anymore. Some of us in here, we feel like we're too old to run. We're going to live it to the young. They got the energy. They've got the capacity. They've got the endurance. I don't got it like I used to. Some of us feel like we're too young to run. Well, maybe when I get to my parents' age, I'll really start taking my faith seriously. Not relevant church, not relevant youth, boy. They're taking their faith seriously right now. Look at them, front row. Front row, second row, spread out all over the room. Students that are passionate about Jesus. Some of us, though, we feel like we're too young. I remember when I was 20, 21 years old and I was out doing my thing. I always said, man, when I get older, when I get married, when I get situated, then I'll slow down. Then I'll start looking into my faith, dummy. I'm too young to run. Some of us in here are like we're too broken to run. But can I tell you, you can't escape this race. It's not going to be easy. The simple fact that he says you have to have endurance, run with endurance, meaning it won't be easy to experience the fullness of life. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a little bit. There's going to be sacrifices that you have to make. There's this business concept of opportunity cost. For every opportunity, there's a loss. To choose A, you're going to have to let go of B. The race is not going to be easy. Listen, you can decide to walk on this race, but you should run. You should absolutely run. Walking is about leisure. Running communicates urgency. Walking is about complacency. Running communicates passion and initiative. That's why Paul, again, in Ephesians 5, 15 through 16, he says this, look carefully, then how you walk. Oh, you're going to walk? Okay. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. If evil's around, are you going to really walk? If evil's around the corner, are you going to run away from it or are you just going to sit there and look? You ever watch some crazy movies, scary movies? And them plum fools be looking for danger on us. I think I hear a sound. I believe it's coming from this side. <laughs> you should have ran, dummy. Paul saying, be wise. These are evil, perilous times. Are you running towards Jesus? Are you running towards your destiny? Or are you walking and getting trapped up? You don't know what life is going to throw at you. You don't know what's going to come next. 
you don't even know how much time you have. So live like you're expiring, because let me tell you something. You are. None of us are going to live forever. But so many of us live every single day like we got all the time in the world. Like tomorrow's guaranteed. There's a race. There's a race set before you. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, looking to Jesus. There's a race set before you. You've got to know who you're running to. The second lesson that we can take out of this is having a right view of Jesus will give you a right view of your race. Having a right view of Jesus will give you a right view of your race. Currently, I'm teaching a class in Relevant Leadership College. If you don't know what Relevant Leadership College, uh, when my wife and I were called to plant Relevant Church, we knew we wanted to be a teaching church. We wanted to take people beyond just Sunday morning, but disciple them to live out their faith uh, in a gospel-shaped way in ministry and their market in the marketplace. We wanted to prepare people to live life and life on purpose. So we launched Relevant Leadership College, and it's been incredible. We've got graduates all throughout this room. We got students in this room who are part. Of relevant leadership college is one of my favorite things, and in this class that I'm teaching, it's called leading from influence. Leading from influence, and in this class, the course text comes from Simon Sinek in a book called "Start with Why." Start with why. He talks about this concept of the golden circle. The golden circle is three concentric circles that help organizations communicate and grow their organizations. I'm going to go technical here for a quick second. So for some of y'all who's like, oh, man, he's doing diagrams, he's writing stuff. Uh, do I feel like I'm in school again? I dropped out six months ago. Come on, Pastor. It's all right. You'll track. If an organization wants to grow customers or grow followers, they have to start with why. Because people follow why you do what you do, not what you do. There's an intrinsic belief that people are buying into when they're connected to your vision or mission or organization. People don't follow the what, people follow the why. And so he says your target should be the why. You've got to start with why. And then when you get from the why, you got to go to the how. Because how many of you guys know you can have all the vision in the world, but if you ain't got no plan, it's all going to fall apart. And then when you get through the how, your what is, what does it look like? What are the vehicles that are going to be used to accomplish your how, which is based off of your why? If you want to grow an organization, if you want to uh, uh, grow a following, you got to start with why because people don't follow what you do. They follow why you do it. You got to tell them how, and then you got to give them a vehicle to be able to actually tran uh, transport that why. This is really good. When we planted Relevant Church, we knew that we wanted a church where people learned to passionately follow Jesus, love across boundaries, and make a tangible difference in their community, region, and world. We wanted a church that helped people discover that Jesus is relevant. That's our why. People often will come and ask us, what do you believe about baptism? I say, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about speaking in tongues? I would say, what do you believe about Jesus? Oh, what do you believe about, about, about the end times? I said, what do you believe about Jesus? Because if we ain't centered on Jesus, none of that other stuff matters at this point. If he is not the way, the truth, and the life, it doesn't matter what you believe about everything else. You're still off course. But how many of you know that we couldn't just stay there? We got to teach them how we're going to do this. Like, oh, my gosh, we want to help people discover that Jesus is relevant. Cool. How are we going to do that? Shoot. I don't know. We have to give them the how. We're going to help people learn to passionately follow Jesus. We're going to keep the main thing the main thing. It's not going to be about rules, regulations. It's not going to be about baptisms and speaking in tongues. It's going to be about Jesus. Yes, those things will come later, but first we got to get centered on Jesus. Let's learn to passionately follow Jesus. Oh, well, how else are we going to do that? We're going to teach people how to love across boundaries. 
It's not about whether you're black, white. It's not about whether you vote Democrat or Republican. It doesn't matter if you're from the other side of the tracks or the more affluent side of the tracks. At the end of the day, in the scripture, it tells us that in the last days, there's going to be a number that cannot be numbered from every kindred, tribe, and tongue. And guess what? What unites us is so much better and so much bigger than what divides us. That's how we're going to do this. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. How else are we going to do this? We're going to make a tangible difference in our community, region, and world. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to be about it. We're going to be people who live with our, with our hearts and our lives outside the four walls. That's why everybody who knows me knows I don't call this building the church. I call it the building because we're the church. You and I are the church. We are the body of Christ. And this building is only a church because God's people gather in it. But after we leave this place, the church is being scattered all throughout the community. And we got to make a tangible difference wherever we are. This building can't do anything without God's people. That's our how. Okay, how are we going to do that? So what are the vehicles we're going to use? So y'all don't know. No, 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 no. We're going to have a church. We're going to gather people in places of worship and connection so that we can point them to Jesus. And then we're going to gather people as the body of Christ that look differently. We're going to come together. We're going to worship. We're going to have music. We're going to have baptisms. And we're going to be uh, preaching. That's the what? How else are you going to do the what, what, how, how else are you going to make sure this vision comes alive? We're going to have relevant leadership college. We're going to create an outfit where people are going to be trained to go beyond just nice Sunday morning participants, but people who want to dig deeper in their faith, grow in theology, understand leadership so that they can be influential people in the marketplace or in ministry. How else are you going to do this? We're going to have regroups, our small groups. We're going to gather people around in circles because church was never meant to be in rows. It was supposed to be in circles. That's our what? Okay, now you know a little bit about relevant church. See, that's why I did like that. But this concept of the golden circle is good because it's gathered all of us together. But in faith, it looks a little different. In faith, we don't start with the why. We don't immediately go to the how. And we don't talk about the what. In faith, we start with who. That's our target. That's where our focus lies. If we don't get the who, we're not going to understand anything else. And then where do we go after that? We go to the why. Why do we follow the who? Why is the why, why, why is the who our target? Why do we have to keep our eyes fixed on the who? And then we go to the how. Today, we're going to focus on these two. The who and the why. The rest of the series, we'll talk about the, the, the how. Faith doesn't start with why, it starts with who. First must have an objective, um, the faith must have an object before it has an objective. Did y'all catch that? Faith must have an object before it has an objective. Because even the Bible in the beginning, God. Genesis begins with the who. The gospel begins with the who. Hebrews 12 starts with a who. John 1 starts with a who. We've got to start with the who before we go to the why and the how and the what. Faith must have a who before it has a how. And who's the who? Jesus. The ever-loving, ever-living, living, co-eternal, co-equal, righteous, king of kings, lord of lords, son of God. Jesus is the who. He says this, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Or could we say Jesus is the author and finisher, the founder and the perfecter of our race? Y'all tracking with me? Jesus knows your race intimately. Knows your race intimately. Barbara, can you? That air conditioner is turned off, and I can see people going like this. Let's get some air moving in here. Jesus knows your race intimately. Why? Because he was, rep- he was present when your race began. Jesus was at the foundation and the creation of the earth, and he was the one who was orchestrating along with the Father and the Holy Spirit your destiny. He knew what you would go through. He knew what you would walk through. 
He designed your race specifically that you will be able to endure whatever life threw at you. Jesus is the son of man, but Jesus is the son of God. In fact, Jesus is God. How do we know this? This is what he says in Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, a.k.a. the author and finisher of your race and your faith. But then he tells us this. Interestingly enough, John 15, you did not choose me. I chose you and sent you out to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that it will last. I designed your race. You didn't choose me. You didn't get up one morning and say, I'm going to choose Jesus today. He's like, listen, you didn't even have the capacity to choose me. You were dead and trapped in your sin, and I had to pick you myself. In fact, I didn't pick you afterwards. I picked you before you fell into the crap that you fell into. <laughs> listen, you were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. You can even save yourself if you wanted to. And I knew exactly what you would go through. That's why I wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life from the beginning and the foundations of the earth. And say, you, you will be mine. I chose you. You didn't choose me. You didn't choose me. Having a right view of Jesus will give you a right view of your race. And what is a right view of your race? Students, I want you all to get this. Jesus is your focus. Yes, we want you to do good in school. Yes, we want you to be nice to your friends. Yes, we want you to get good grades. But ultimately, that's not your focus. Jesus is. Because when Jesus is your focus, all those things fall into place. When Jesus is your focus, you have the energy to study. If Jesus is your focus, you've got the capacity to love your knuckleheaded friends that you see every day and say, like, I can't stand you on a low. Jesus is the ultimate focus. You got a race in front of you. You got to know who you're running to. And you got to know why you're running. You got to know why you're running. Jesus not only pioneers the course of your life, he also walks alongside of you every step of the way. But he not only walks with you every step of the way, Jesus is already at the finish line saying, welcome home, baby. I've been waiting on you. Why? Because we serve a God who's not held by time and space. Jesus is at the beginning, he's the end, and he's everything in the middle. Jesus is there right there with you. I've, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He who overcomes, I will allow to sit next to me, next to my father. Jesus is already at the end, he is at the beginning, and he's here right with us, championing us on and saying, I'm with you. If you keep your eyes focused on me, just follow me. He is our lead coach. He's the one leading us and saying, just keep your eyes on me. Doesn't matter if you stumble, I'm going to come grab you. Doesn't matter if you fall, I'm going to help you up. He's the author and finisher of your faith. And let me tell you, faith, faith, faith has more to do with your race than you think. Why? Because your faith will determine the quality and the capacity of your race. All right, now we're going deep for a second. I need y'all to lean in. Put your thinking caps in. I don't want to lose none of y'all. First service, I almost lost them on this part. Y'all leaned in. Faith has more to do with your race than you would believe. Your faith, your faith will determine the quality and capacity of your race. Guess what? You going to go in this race anyway. You going to have to move through this race anyway. Do you want the life hack to make your race a little better? To make your race a little sure? To make sure you get to the finish line and you have the endurance? Your faith is going to determine the quality and the capacity of your race. Your faith is the why factor. This is what we teach them in RLC. If you lose your why, you'll lose your way. If you lose your why, you'll lose your way. Think about it. Why does anybody quit anything? You lost the why. Why do we quit things that we start? Because we lost our why. Why do we quit businesses that we launched? Because it got hard and we forgot about the why. We got so focused in the what that we lost our way. Why do marriages end? Nobody walks into a marriage with an escape hatch unless there's a prenup. Then there was a situation at the beginning where you were like, I don't really trust you.
But no one goes into a marriage thinking about the day when they're going to fall out of love. The reason that the marriage falls apart because one or both ended up losing their why of why they got together in the first place. Why, why, why does our faith fall apart? Because we forgot the who and the why of our faith. We forgot the object and the objective of our faith. Faith is the why factor. And we lose our why when we lose, we get distracted. We get thrown off course. Listen, without the quality, without faith, the quality of your race is determined by external factors. Man, listen, I'm, the next few moments, I'm going to be preaching so strong. Y'all better write this down. I'm going to preach very calmly, but I'm going to be preaching strong. Y'all better internalize this thing because I'm giving you a life hack. Without faith, the quality of your race is determined by external factors. Time. I just don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time to work out. I don't have time to study. I don't have time to invest in my relationship. I don't have time to develop new connections. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to be a part of a regroup. I don't have time. When your faith is affected, the quality of your race is going to be affected by external factors. Disappointment. I can't believe that happened. I can't believe they did that to me. I can't believe I was left all alone. I can't believe I got abandoned. I can't believe this situation happened to me. You will always be looking and focused on somebody else, and it will throw you off of your race. That's why there's so many complainers. People who just complain about everything. Well, it's hard because, well, my boss be, did this. Well, my mom did this or my dad didn't do this. Oh, you got all these external factors when they're saying, hey, focus on the who. Understand the why. He's the author and finisher of your race. There's nothing, no whipping formed against me will prosper when Jesus Christ is my Lord because he's the author and finisher of my faith. Oh, I fell off the wagon. Oh, I used again. Oh, I drank again. Oh, I had sex again. Oh, I fell off again. Oh, this happened. Oh, this happened. All of a sudden, your focus is off. Well, God didn't really forgive me. God doesn't really love me. God. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, he is the way, the truth, and the life. The quality of your, without faith, the quality of your race is determined by external factors, distractions. Distractions. Like the students right now, on their phone. Nah, they taking notes. That's, that's, <laughs> like they, they looked up quick. No takers of history makers. We say that to them all the time. <laughs> Distractions will throw us off of our race. The new shiny item. What's happened in politics 2024, y'all? Your race was fine for the last four years until you turn on Fox News and CNN. And in all these distractions and all of these tricks and charlatans get on there and try to convince you that they've got the hope of humanity. Let me tell you, ain't nobody got the hope of humanity but Jesus Christ, who is the Lord, who is King of Kings. Who sits on the throne. There's no government that's going to put him down. There's not government that ever elected him. Y'all getting this? Without faith, the quality of your race is determined by external factors. Without faith, your capacity, your capacity, your ability to endure, your ability to get to the end is determined by human ability. I told you this is good preaching. Some of y'all don't really believe me. Take these notes and start living them, and your life will be transformed. I promise you. 
Without faith, your capacity is determined by your own human uh, ability. I, I, I can't read the Bible like that. I don't understand the word of God. I, I get bored. I get distracted. I just get frustrated because I don't understand the Bible. That's because you're focusing on your human ability. The Bible is not a physical book. It is a spiritual book. It's supposed to come alive and go internally inside of you. It is not you who interprets the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit who interprets your life. Through the lens of the Bible. Who? What? Well, Pastor, you know, I just, I just, every time I open the Bible, I just, I get sleepy. <laughs> when I open the Bible, I get sleepy too. So I stand up. And I walk reading it. And you know what I say? God, get me something out of this word. Teach me something out of this word. Because if I try to hold it with my own human ability, my own capacity is going to be limited But what I understand. In fact, God, you better go ahead and take control of me reading this word. Otherwise, I'm going to read it into the way I want to read it. And then all types of crazy theology and doctrine is going to come up. I need you to guide this process, God. Without faith, your capacity is determined by human ability. Oh, oh, pastor, you know, I wanted to be a church, but my job won't give me Sundays off. Is your boss God or is God God? Because last I heard, my God can do exceedingly, abundantly, all I can ask, think, or imagine. So when is the last time you fell to your knees and say, God, I want to be with your people Sunday morning. I want to gather and worship. I need a miracle. I need you to do something incredible so that I can absolutely get this job. And sometimes a miracle says, quit. Oh, y'all didn't want to hear that one. Well, what about my finances? Well, I serve a God who's got a cattle on a thousand hills who is able to provide exceedingly abundantly all I can think or imagine. Do you know him? When your faith is focused on human ability, your capacity to run this race is going to be hindered. God, I'm not enough. God, I'm broken. God, I did some really bad things. I remember somebody I was talking to, Pastor, Pastor, I've done some really bad things. I'm on the phone with him. He's crying. Pastor, I've done some really bad things. You don't understand how bad I am. Pastor, you don't understand. Uh, I don't think God can save me. Uh, Pastor, I don't, I don't know. Listen, I serve a God who so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Why? Because my Jesus took the sins of yours and mine on his back and canceled them past, present, and eternity. And there's nothing, nothing that will separate you from the love of God. Without faith, your capacity is determined by your human ability. Without faith, everything will stand in the way of your race. Then they go ahead and come up. Let me tell you, Jesus, the third and last lesson is this. Jesus is not just the author and finisher of your race. He's the prize of your race. He's the prize. What are you living for? Why do you get up every single day? Are you thought is to make money, have a good family, live the American dream? Well, if you do that, you're going to end up disappointed. Because money fades away. Family turns its back on you. And the American dream can go with a bad economic crisis. If you put your faith in anything else but the who and the why, you will come up short. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. Jesus is not just the author and finisher. He's the prize. People wonder why they stay in depression because your prize is this life. People wonder why they can't get ahead because your prize is achievement. 
Jesus is the prize, friends. And without faith, without the why, you'll misconstrue the destination of your race. You'll get it wrong over and over, and you'll just continue to wallow and strive and wonder why you're not getting satisfaction. I notice I'm speaking to somebody in this room today because you have it all together. You've got the white picket fence. You've got the nest egg. But the reality is your life is still not satisfied. You've got the trophy husband or the trophy wife, yet you're still not satisfied. You have everything you need. You've got the American dream. You've got the degree, but there's still more missing and you can't figure out what it is. Jesus is the only sure prize without faith your focus will be on temporary benefits some of us in here have begun to idolize money I just got to get more money that's why you don't give that's why you don't tithe you idolize money because you think without money, your life is going to fall apart. Listen, money is good. I like money. You should like money. God created money. But money can't be your prize. Why? Because 1 Timothy 6.10, the writer Paul reminds us, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is not the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, the inordinate appetite, insatiable desire of more, more money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, everybody say some people, people. craving money have wandered from the truth of the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. How many people have given up their faith for a paycheck? How many people have decided to not be in fellowship with the body of Christ and severed their relationship with the body just so that they can make a little extra? People have given, con- given up connection to the body of Christ for two more dollars on their paycheck. Some of us, family, is the one people don't like the most. Because America, I think America has idolized, especially suburban America, has idolized family. Our family has become our idols. Some of y'all in here worship your kids more than you worship God. Your whole life is wrapped up in your snot nose kids. And I know they're 22, 32, 42, they still snot nose. Because you're busy wiping it, beep, 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 you know, just. We idolize our kids. Some of us in here idolize our spouses, our girlfriends, our boyfriends, our significant others. We idolize them. Everything that we do is through the lens of happy wife, happy life. Idiot. Because if you ain't happy, is this a fair Some of us idolize just relationships that we have. This is Jesus. Everybody say, this is Jesus, Jesus. not the pastor. pastor. Matthew 10, 37. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. This is Jesus not the pastor. See, these are the texts that we try to stay away from. And listen, I'm not going to knock any other church. But even I, as a pastor, have wanted to shy away from these texts because I didn't want to push people away. Because Jesus tells us, oh, y'all thought I came to bring peace? The only peace I came to bring was to reconcile you back to the Father. But you know what? I came to bring a sword, and mother is going to be against daughter, and father is going to be against son, and sister-in-law is going to be against sister-in-law. He said, listen, I came to bring a sword that's going to make you choose. Where is your allegiance going to lie? I remember I told a couple. I said, listen. 
your spouse can't be your God. And right now, it looks like you're idolizing your spouse. And you know what they did? They left. They just went to another church where they wouldn't preach that. Idolize family. Idolize money. Without faith, your focus will be on a prize that will have a temporary benefit. What about the American dream? The nuclear family with two and a half kids, dog, white picket fence, and retirement where you can sit back and enjoy the leisure of life. Everybody say, this is Jesus, not the pastor. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal it. It's all going to burn. It's all going to go away. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. This is Jesus, not the pastor. How about we just, maybe you don't have the American dream. Maybe you're, maybe you're a student. You're like, I'm not married yet. That doesn't apply to me. Or maybe you just broke and be like, listen, it ain't money because I'm broke as a joke without hope. <laughs> maybe your family's broken and you don't idolize family because there's nothing to idolize. But you know what we can all relate on? Sin. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says no one is good. No, not one. Oh, yeah, so quit patting your own back because you're a dirty joker just like everybody else. This is what he says. Paul says, now the works of the flesh, meaning the desire to do your own thing, are evident. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. Idolatry. Oh, shoot. That was all the other three combined. Witchcraft. Oh, pastor, that doesn't apply to me. Shh, listen to some of the music you listen to. Straight witchcraft. Some of the movies we watch. Witchcraft. Y'all know I like crazy movies, but there's some movie. We were at the house last week, and there was this movie like, because I have to see the preview. I got to see it first. I saw the preview. I'm like, witchcraft. Nope. Hatred. Discord. Some of y'all just love drama. Y'all love creating, talking about it, being involved in it. Jealousy. Too busy looking at everybody else, not focus on Jesus. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions, divisions. Oh, pastor, I'm just an op opinionated person. No, you like division. You're disorderly. You're a problem. Well, I just want to speak my mind. No, shut up. Nobody want to hear you in the first place. <laughs> Envy. Drunkenness. Man, we, just, we turned up. I mean, I was good, though. I wasn't really drunk. Why were you stumbling like that then? Why'd you say what you said? I mean, I just, you know, it was just liquid courage. Orgies. Some of y'all are into that sort of thing. And things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Without faith, you will misconstrue the destination of your race. Without faith, you will focus on a prize that only has temporary benefit. But when you got faith in the who and the why, you will understand that faith has to do. Faith has an object. His name is Jesus. Faith has to do with the all and the wonder of the person and work of Jesus. Can I tell you about Jesus? 
the writer of Hebrews says this, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the power of his word. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him there is nothing that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Can I tell you about Jesus? Philippians says this, Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can I tell you about Jesus? Jesus says this about himself in Revelations. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me. I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Don't just walk, run to Jesus. He is the prize. In Jesus, there's perspective to my position. There's purpose in my pain. In Jesus, there's power in my pursuit. Jesus didn't just simply walk to the cross. He was purposeful, intentional, and pursued the cross. He did it for the prize on the other side, reuniting with God the Father and saving you and I from the righteous wrath of God, securing our eternal redemption through the power of the shed blood on Calvary's cross. Don't just walk, run to Jesus. He is the prize. He is the prize. He is the prize. Run to Jesus. He is the who and he's the why. And guess what? He can teach you the how. Don't just walk. Run to Jesus. Run to accept him as Savior and declaring him Lord over your lives. The Bible tells us simply this. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Your focus will be sure. You will be sealed with an eternal redemption that's secured by the Holy Spirit. He says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and then you will receive the Holy Spirit. 